uh, due to a family emergency. Hopefully, uh, they just keep him in your mind and prayers as we go along. Um, otherwise, I want to welcome everyone that's here. Unfortunately, we do not have enough for a quorum today, so we will not be able to vote on anything. However, we're going to be here long enough to discuss a few issues and move forward from there. So, with that, uh, do we, well, we can't approve the minutes either. Uh, with that, we'll just move straight to the end items. <laughs> Uh, as far as the MS emergency services uh, uh, billing update, Chief Fairbanks. I passed out, uh, passed out the collection report for 21-22. Uh, we have changed our report that uh, we've given to you in the past. This one hopefully is more friendly. Jennifer worked hard on this one to. Uh, make it more readable so you can tell what's owed, what's, uh, how many calls were billed, the number of responses, and of course we've talked about all this in the past. But hopefully this is a more friendly uh, sheet and version for everyone to break down the collections. Total amount of collections deposited for 21 and 22 were $4,842,006.94. And to me, it's a lot better, easier to read. It's for me personally. I don't know how the other committee members feel about it. Uh, have any of you had time to look at it by any chance? And I believe if we would have had our uh, time of that three months of COVID that we were down in the office, I believe we would have been even a little closer, if not over that projected, but we couldn't project what COVID was going to do last year. So we apologize, but it, it got close, even though we had the three bad months of COVID with the office. Commissioner Cry. John, let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, it's the first time I've seen it, but uh, we uh, have billings of, take one month here, May of 22 of $30,983, but we have collection of $363. Then we have zero amount sent for collection. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, this is prior billings. I, I'm, I'm confused. Uh, and you look over somewhere else here, the number of runs that we've made, uh, I'm just confused. Can you enlighten me a little bit, please? I'm going to pass the to the billing expert back okay. here. That will be fine. Okay, so the, the number of responses, number of reports, and actual transports those are accurate numbers for each of those months because we took that from our um, medical reporting software. It, it will track that for us. So those are accurate, up-to-date numbers of what happened. However, the billing portion of it, we're always behind. So what that's saying is, for example, we have completed um, April, um, we have completed it all on there on our end in the office. Um, Digitech, the billing company, has not completed all of April's billing, but as of this morning, that's how much they have billed. Example for for example in for April dates of service, for May dates of service, we are currently working on May. They have only billed that thirty thousand nine eighty three for May transports that happened in May. What you're telling telling us is that we have a billing company that runs their collection three months at a time? Is that what you're well, saying? our policy is we don't send anything to collections unless it has gone 90 days with no contact from the patient, no contact, you know, no payments oh, I, made. I, I, I can understand that, but let me back up. Uh, same, same comment, question. Uh, we only bill $30,983 
Are we running 90 days to nine times as we have been built? We're not quite 90 days. We've actually we've gained about maybe two weeks. Um, at one point, we were almost almost four months, but we're less than 90 days now. Um, so what that's saying, that's the n number that I got this morning when I ran the report from their software. Um, we have sent through several days for May already, but that's how much billing they have completed on their end. I appreciate your response. Uh, uh -huh. I would, my only suggestion is we put the afterburner. Well, I can assure you we're there every day. I mean, we're doing the best we can do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions about billing? Cindy. Cindy. Uh, Commissioner Slater, please. So would it be a fair statement to say that the total charges in May, when we look at this next month, will increase from $30,983? And so kind of to piggyback off what Commissioner Cry had said, the amount deposited for May, the $363,000, could have come from October, November, December, January, or February. You don't really know where that's coming from. It's not really tied to the 30000 that you billed. Jen can correct me if I'm wrong. The EOBs will tell us where that money goes and who to apply it to and all that, but which month it comes in from the billing, you're absolutely correct. We have no idea. Uh, with no other questions, we'll move on to the staffing. How is staffing going so far with EMS? Staffing with EMS, if it's okay with the chair, I'm going to let Mike Guerin give his That's report fine. on that. Uh, right now, uh, we are severely understaffed. We just recently went through our uh, license renewal with the state uh, this past June. And I was comparing numbers from last year to this year. Uh, last year in June, we had, uh, I was going to say, 92. I think it was 92 employees. Right now, we have 55 full-time employees. And I think we have some 20-some-odd uh, part-time part employees. Uh, we're getting applications. However, it's EMT basics. Uh, not had a paramedic application in months. Uh, even after uh, we did the Indeed, we did uh, Facebook, several different uh, avenues. Uh, they're just not out there. Uh, sadly, it's not just a Bradley County issue. It's it's statewide, nationwide. Um, I attribute. Uh, a couple of factors for that. One, this generation is a lot different than our generation when we grew up. Uh, there's uh, not that heart of service out there much anymore. And two, uh, I lay a lot of the blame on our state governments. Uh, they are making it just almost impossible for uh, people to, to go to school. EMS is the only profession, as I, I know you guys know, uh, in, in, in emergency services, you know, we can hire a police officer off the street, send him to the academy, he gets paid while he goes to the academy, then he comes, goes to work. Same idea with fire. You can hire them off the street, train them, pay them, and then put them to work. EMS, you have to have all your stuff up front, and that's all on the, on the, the individual. And uh, the state in, in Tennessee has broken down, used to have, we used to have two levels of licensure, EMT, IV, and a paramedic. Well, in their wisdom, they have broken this down into four licensures. Emergency medical responder, 
which is a class that the student has to pay to go to. Then they have to pay their fees to the state. Then they have to pay to take the National Registry test. Several hundreds, a couple thousand bucks. Same thing, EMTB. You got to go to class, pay all those fees, test, pay the state application fee, take the National Registry, so on and so forth. EMTA, advance, same thing. So by the time you go through all four of those and you get your paramedic, you've sunk $25,000 into it, and uh, it's just God's grace if you pass that test. The National Registry, uh, ever since Tennessee got involved with National Registry, uh, I personally have seen a decline in personnel. I'm all for education, but this National Registry testing that they have adopted for the state of Tennessee, nobody knows where that money goes, and that's how they make their money is on these tests. And the pass-fail rate on that test is ridiculous. So they pay $175, I think, uh, for a paramedic to take this test. Ten people take it, four of them's going to pass it. So they have to retake the test and pay that fee. We've got several. We've got two right now who is, I would say, bar none, probably two of the best EMTs that you could ask for. They've got the heart. They've got the skill. They've got the knowledge. They can do it all. They cannot pass that test. And they're getting to where they're just... You know, what's what's why 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 do I keep throwing this money away? And they're getting discouraged. So I I this is not a Bradley County problem. Uh, you know, we of course you know we're like everybody else. We all have our issues, but I lay it all at the feet of the state of Tennessee, making this. It's a money making uh, process, and it's it's killing our profession. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, let me get, uh, since we now have a quorum, let me get the approval of the minutes, and then we'll move straight from there to the rest. The motion's been made by Commissioner Hunt Thompson. Do we have a second? Second by Commissioner Crow. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone against? No. Uh, so, motion passes. All in favor. Now let's move back into the staffing. Are we done with staffing as far as is there any other we need to follow up with? Commissioner Crow, you have a question? I, uh, I have another one of these pointed questions for you, sir, so bear with me, all right? Uh, having been licensed in my life as a real estate guy and an appraiser, my uh, home address, phone number, and everything's on file at the state register. Have we made any attempt at a mailing for this southeastern Tennessee region to go after these people that are presently licensed? Uh, we have not. We should, all right? Okay. Uh, this is gutter warfare, survival of our ambulance service, mm -hmm. and we should go after them. Yeah. Uh, we offer, or did offer, a bonus. I don't know. Yes, we still do. All we... right? We need to use it yeah. because we, with vacant positions, we're accumulating a, what I call a piggy bank. Okay. Yes, sir. Get staff, get these ambulances on the road. That's yes, sir. Fine. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, and that is an excellent idea. Uh, the sad thing is most of these folks, it's like this year at Cleveland State, I think they have a grand total of six people that are going to attend paramedic school. Um, when I went to paramedic school in 2012, or correction, uh, 2010, we had like 60 people in our program. So it's, there's some out there, and, and uh, one thing is private industry is taking a lot of paramedics. Uh, they can go, just say, for instance, I used to be a paramedic at Bowwater. 
you can go to Bowater and I sat in a chair for 12 hours and made $25 an hour. You know, it's it's a tough situation. I, I wished we had some better answers. Uh, I know we uh, we do a lot in the schools. We've got people teaching the uh, EMR classes. I think you, Jeff teaches some at some of the high schools. We're recruiting, trying to trying to uh, get these kids early. But the state is wanting to put it the burden off on the counties. Their answer is, okay, Bradley County, uh, set up you an academy, and you can teach your own. And my answer to the, uh, my response to him was, well, who's going to pay for that? Because we're going to have to hire instructors. We have to have an appropriate facility. You know, that's their answer. They're putting the, the burden on the counties. And uh, as you guys well know, we don't have money to uh, just throw willy-nilly around for that extra stuff. But I do, uh, that is a good idea, Commissioner Cry. Well, thank you. I, 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 I think we've got to do what we have to do. I don't give a flip if we irritate the hell out of the rest of Tennessee. we got to get our staffing up to date. Right. Yes, sir. I, I'm quite sure there is a photo of me on the wall over in Nashville because uh, we need a, I uh, need to put a crayon on that thing. I uh, I've not made many friends over there in the last uh, couple months. Mr. Thompson, I get back when Cleveland State. Uh, I remember us talking something about Cleveland State and what it would cost to go to school over there. And, uh, what kind of refresh my memory on this? But uh, when when they decided to do that, did we not? You offered a bonus, I believe. You offered a bonus, what five thousand like dollars? We have a sign-on bonus of five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars. Then where did it go from there? Just talking about the difference. Uh, they had to still pay a cost. I mean, I not only are you paying for the schooling and the books and all that stuff you're paying to take the test each time and the test if what he's saying is the test is hard uh, it's made up by doctors and nurses all over the world and it depends on how good your curriculum is and your instructors are but what it gets down to is is if you don't pass that test then there's another retest fees and retest fees and it keeps going and uh, it gets very expensive. Uh, paramedic school alone is fifteen grand. Uh, that's just for paramedic. You've already had to come from your EMTs and all that other stuff to get all those certifications. And then it it just keeps rolling on with the money uh, out of pocket for that person to come do a career uh, that they lose and get disheartened in because they have trouble with that test. And what are the, the, we doing to help them over there? Those in Cleveland State, what it costs, and what do we do? Does that come out of your? Well, we what? we partnered with Cleveland State and did the Danny Lawson Scholarship, where we can send two to paramedic school each year from Bradley County EMS. So we have two in that are fixing to graduate. We'll be sending two more this coming school year. Uh, but that's what we have worked out with them right now is we're doing two full ride scholarships for. EMTs at Bradley County EMS that can go to paramedic school. I guess what is the question is what is the problem? Is it pay? Paramedics? We, are we low on pay for paramedics? Whatever, uh, when you we, we just went to 50,000 starting out for paramedic. I haven't done a pay study in so long I couldn't tell you. So that had that hadn't made a difference. I, I don't know what it what it is. Uh, of course, everybody wants more money, and especially in our economy at this current time. But uh, sometimes you think it's money, and when you do it, and we did the five thousand dollar bonus, it it didn't make a big difference. Uh, we gave a raise last year, and we have got a raise this year. Uh, they're not beating my door down. I don't know what it is. Job description. Part of it, and part of it is the the 
willingness to have a, a or they don't have servant hearts. Uh, this business, you have to have a servant heart. And you got to want to take care of people. You got to. A lot of people use this as a stepping stone before they get their nurse practitioner or their nursing license or, you know, move into the private industry, like Mike said, with uh, Bowwater and Mueller. Mueller takes a lot of people. Uh, the industry pay, you know, Amazon pays good for a paramedic to sit up there in a Band-Aid station. It helps those companies with their insurance rates and stuff, so they have paramedics on site. So there's a lot of paramedics in the industry. Uh, but I can't answer truthfully and know for sure if it's money that's keeping them from here. What's your recommendation? Try to get, you got any, any ideas at all? We've pretty much beat our head on the wall. We've tried a lot of stuff. Uh, I don't know what the answer is, Mr. Thompson. Uh, I, I couldn't answer that right now without some thought. Well, I, I didn't know if it was something. This may be something we need to talk about if there is a recommendation. And uh, all first responders, I know, have, have problems competing with other counties, other cities. So, so uh, something we need to talk about. We're going to continue with family service. We need to because we've got a lot of families. Quit and everything else. So maybe we need to sit down and uh, try to work out something. I don't, I don't know what it's going to take. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure that the revenue is going to be one of the answers. What we can do. Sometimes, sometimes we raise keep schools in mind. I'm, I'm First of all, apologies for missing this meeting. I, I uh, lost track of the days after the election last night, so to be <laughs> honest with you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, the, we're talking about recruitment here. We're talking about how you can recruit the future. Sounds the Pi Center at this point, and what you just said about having a servant's heart, having this desire to help people, there's still some space over there. If there's a way to look at some where you can grasp a 15-year-old that's wanting to get out on the road and do all the challenging things you do and being prepared for that, maybe we could look at how Pi, the Pi Center could start developing a future workforce for you, uh, maybe even have people that uh, would love to do this but need a fast track how that happens. Maybe we should be working with our legislators to make it easier to become a uh, a beginning EMS worker, and then you guys take them from there. So there's some fast tracks that happen in, in uh, higher education where you have somebody that's in a certain field and needs one year to get ready to go teach. Well, that's what I do. So I see people that are accountants that go to a school and in a year can come out with a teaching certificate and teach math. So, I mean, there's ways to look at that, but um, as, as I said, we're going to have to start thinking out of the box how to do this and start building that group. Maybe we look at, too, the, the criteria required to be certified through the through community colleges and all that. 
with our newly elected folks that are going from here. Uh, if we could get some movement on that where you could get people that are in other fields that, are, that don't want to sit at a desk, that have the talent to do the things, how we move them through. So maybe that's something we could be looking at there. But uh, I think there are young people that have servant, servant hearts. Uh, we've got to capture them. We've got to capture them for, for your program as well as a lot of the other ones. Teachers have a, have a servant's heart. Uh, people that go into business and want to do accounting and give people money to buy their houses have servant's heart in a lot of ways. So if we can capture that stuff, um, maybe. And I, I, is there a way to upgrade the two at Cleveland State to get four at Cleveland State to get six? We got a new president over there. Maybe we can kind of. Do you have a opportunity with people to ready to move to to that paramedic letter? Because I know that's a biggie for you. Is there Our a requirement right now is. I would have to go back and look at the paper, but so many two to three years with Bradley County. We don't want to put money into someone that's walking in this door and walking back out that door. True. We want to know if they're going to stay with us a minute before we invest that much Correct. time and effort because right. it is a scholarship, but um, it's getting harder and harder to find that person okay. uh, because right. of other opportunities that arise. Well, so I'm willing to talk with Cleveland State if, if they want to up the – now, I think last year – they had money from the rescue plan and all that kind of stuff that they actually paid for a lot of people's last year hmm. on top of our two. Yeah. But getting those folks into that program right now is, is an issue. Uh, I went before Mike went to medic school, and uh, there were 30 in my class. And at that time, you had the option to take the state paramedic test or to take that national registry test mm -hmm. but everybody's moved to straight national registry and uh, there is no more state test it's all national registry so which, which is the tough test very tough test on all levels of its capacity And that's why his pitchers in Nashville getting darts thrown at it. The county leaders and put pressure on our legislators uh, because I would. I can't quote this verbatim, but from a state educator, I was told a couple months ago that the state of Tennessee is moving toward EMS becoming uh, a private. Uh, your, your rural counties uh, are basically going to end up going away. It's going to be private services, kind of like health care, moving away from county-owned hospitals going into corporations. Uh, and it's a, it's a political game in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And the people of our state are, are uh, suffering because of it. You know, 
Fairbanks though. Chief Fairbanks, I do have one question. We've He's brought up the private companies. I know that private companies have to have the same issues we have, but how does that work exactly? Because they have to have short calls. Or their funding has to be short from what they're getting on the insurance to pay from that. So how do they make up the difference where they're able to pay more and do what they're doing? If you can explain that. I actually know the answer to that because you've told me. but I have. You alluded to it. How's that? Is in other words, when a company, when a county takes out a contract with a county. Oh, oh okay, 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 okay. Uh, when, when a private industry comes in, <laughs> a private company, I was lost there for a minute, I'm sorry. Uh, they could end up uh, saying, this is what we will run calls for in your county. We will provide you this many ambulances and, and this much coverage. Uh, we're going to need X number of dollars from the county. And then we get to keep all the insurance money or take of collections. So that's how they try to make up for it is they do a contract with the county to say this is what it would cost you for us to run. And then we will, we get to keep everything we make also. So there's a honeymoon phase when that happens. They make it look real good. They can run it for a lot less dollar wise cost to the county but then after the honeymoon phase is over and it's time to renew the contract most of the ones that I've known about or been told about they have always raised it significantly after that honeymoon phase is over that first contract as we know all private you're you're only in business to lose money you're in business to make it so you're going to make it one way or the other and typically that's how they're making up for it it's through the county itself and yes, that all, the, all, all even those private services are having trouble with employees retention now and keeping uh, we've been in contact with air medical services here lately and they're having trouble finding people also mm -hmm. even to be on the helicopters right. there any other questions let's see no others let's move on to the next the updates on the ambulance and convalescent van you can tell us about those I will mayor correct me if I miss up any of this uh, the ambulance that you all and the mayor approved to be purchased in last year's budget is built at International, the truck that we need to put the box on. The truck is built, been through the mod shop, it's sitting at International, ready to go. They do not have a computer chip that goes in the Allison <clears throat> transmission, so they can't take it off the lot to get it to bell buckle for us to put the box on it. So it's set at International. The estimated arrival of chips to go into um, the transmission at International is September. They are expecting to hopefully get a shipment of those chips by September. So that one will go to Bell Buckle. The box is already there waiting on it to be uh, assembled and, and redone. Uh, and then the other convalescent van because you approved two of those in last budget we got one they didn't know when the second one would be here the second one is here uh, at AEV over in North Carolina uh, there was a price increase because nothing is locked in anymore so uh, I've been with the mayor we've worked it out that one should be here in September also they said they needed about 60 days to turn it out because they had just got the delivery in. When the ambulance manufacturer gets those vans, uh, they're, they're just plain vans, and then they put all the boxes and seats and equipment on it to make it an ambulance. And then uh, from the ambulance that wrecked on Inman Street a couple of months ago, the insurance money came in for that. We put that together with some other stuff that the mayor had from I think the rescue plan monies and stuff and we are going to purchase a new international truck front to back uh, from AEV also uh, but the estimated time on it would be 18 months but if we don't get in line worse I'm up to two years on fire trucks if I were to order one so it's just a continuous wait uh, but that's what I have in mayor. Do you want to add anything? Okay. Any other questions? 
Hey, you're 18 months on fire truck. Fire trucks are now two years. But we have one that will be here about September ish. Uh, it's almost done. I've been, we've been getting reported that the, the, the ladder truck, the tower truck we ordered, uh, we, we missed that uh, part of the wait time on it. We got our drawings done, got our pre plans done. It's being built. Uh, hopefully, they're marrying the cab and the, the box together this week. Uh, I, I think they're real close to putting it all the pieces together because we, we will be up there probably less in less than 30 days to do the final inspection on it. We're real close on it, hitting it. Commissioner Cross. I have a couple of comments. Uh, <clears throat> what is the cause of the increase in delay time of the fire, fire truck? Parts. Uh, imports, getting parts, uh, everything. Everything's hard to get now. Just sending an ambulance or a fire truck to get worked on, you don't know how long it's going to take because the person you take it to has to order parts, and you don't know when those parts are coming in. Yeah. There's no competition either, am I correct, between the, the places you go to? I go to a lot. I use Lee Smith, Diesel Plus. I'm talking about the, the big boys. Oh, oh yeah, there's a lot of competition out there. Uh, the other issue I have is on the chip for the transmission. Uh, we've been going through this now. Over four on the chip. Uh, have we bothered to send a letter or thought about sending a letter to Senator Haggerty and Representative Fleischman on the need for the federal government to get involved on stuff like this? Please. I have not. I, uh, I'd like to make a motion, prepare a letter, uh, send it both to Fleischman and uh, Haggerty on the situation that we have and the importance of someone doing something at the federal government. I'd like to make a motion. I have a second. I have a second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Passes unanimously. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I talk about chips. So uh, I've got a truck sitting up there, been waiting three months on the chip. So it's not just the fire truck, it's not just the ambulance, it's everybody. So uh, I, I don't know what the problem is. Probably hiding, I don't know. Anybody yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, somebody dropped the ball at the other yeah. Commissioner Winters. You, you mentioned about the accident. Uh, how are the uh, staffing? How, how are the folks? Are they well? They're doing back? fine. Everybody's uh, back. Is she back yet? September 5th, the second one will be back. She's doing fine, though. Uh, the, the male that was in there, he, he's been back for several weeks now. So they're doing good. Good. Well, we've moved right on into fire department without uh, on the agenda without moving too far. But uh, as far as staffing for the fire department, how are we doing? Uh, we're doing pretty good. It's okay. I'm gonna let Deputy Chief Stewart talk about staffing. That's fine. <clears throat> this time we are five short of the full time uh, employees as firefighters. Uh, we've lost um, we lost one to. Catoosa County a week ago uh, he went and then we've lost some to some disciplinary actions and one uh, two brothers actually quit uh, going to move a different part of the south in the country so but that's where we're at we're five so we're planning on to start in there getting the process of starting a rookie school or, well, that's what I was starting to ask about with the rookie school. And it, it's good to see the new state rep. And congratulations uh, also. Uh, uh, congratulations also on your, your selection. Um, 
we were down at the fire department. We just spoke about the ladder truck. I don't know if you guys want to update on that, or do you want an update on that also? Kind of catch you up a little bit. Okay. It's black and red, and it's pretty. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the uh, the ladder truck is being being built. Uh, we've almost been at a year and a half or more long process in getting this ladder built. It is uh, the cabin chassis are together. All the electronics and hydraulics are being assembled at this time. The pump is in. Um, they just have not married the back half of the truck with the front half of the truck. I'm expecting that to be done at any time. And they'll have the ladder on it. Uh, it's coming together real well. Paint's looking good. Uh, I'll try to share some pictures with Lori, and you all can see it for yourselves. Uh, me and Jeff get those uh, weekly every Friday, so we will get new pictures today, and I've been sharing those with the mayor also. So, but I'll get those to Lori so she can share them with you all. And I think you're looking at September sometime beginning of that, hopefully. Yes, uh, end of August, first of September ish. Uh, we're expected to go to Wisconsin to do the uh, final inspection. If you will, once we get through, or once we get that, will you let the members that are the present members now of the um, of this committee know when it's arrived, so I'm sure they'd want to see it. Uh, they yeah, were y'all can help part push it, it in the bay. That'll be excellent <laughs> if you'll just notify us that time. Yes, and this Commissioner Fair. Yeah, this one will go under the bypass, like the cities will not. Right, ours, ours right will now. Go yeah, right now they have trouble with that underpass over yeah, here with ladder good. trucks. But you know, uh, we had the foresight to at least think about. That. We made our height to where, and this is a mid-mount instead of a rear-mounted ladder. This is a mid-mount ladder. They can get lower profile. That's why we've done this. Uh, so everything's looking good on that. All right. Uh, Chief Fairbanks, you had actually put this on the agenda, the uniform. So I'm going to allow you to take the time to explain that to everyone, and then we'll move forward from there. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I have received uh, an anonymous email uh, twice now from uh, someone at the fire department and they are requesting to wear shorts on duty uh, they want uniform shorts um, I think because our friends uh, that just went by uh, are wearing them uh, they seem to need to uh, it, their letter explained and due to this intense heat that we're having uh, they felt it appropriate they, uh, I don't know how many of you all might have gotten it. Uh, it was sent out uh, to several people uh, last time in an email, but still unnamed. Uh, I would want the person to come talk to me and me and Chief Stewart have a discussion with them about it, but no open dialogue has been made otherwise. Um, they, they put a lot of URLs and... Uh, stuff into their research paper about the benefits of wearing shorts and staying cool. Uh, we can come up with just as many that are unsafe for firefighters, I believe, to be wearing short uh, under undergarment pants or whatever to, to calls. Uh, we, we are in a hazardous situation in our job, and I do not believe that shorts are appropriate uh, to be worn, and I can... Uh, bore you with all the research uh, of why that would not be. But we deal with bloodborne pathogens. We deal with glass. We deal with metal. We deal with heat. We deal with fire. Uh, firemen know they're getting into a job that is heat-related. Uh, just to wear shorts on duty is not a good enough reason that you feel like you're hot sitting around the station. I don't know. So... Uh, before this comes up or anybody identifies their self, I would like to recommend, if someone would, that we don't wear shorts in Bradley County Fire Department. Uh, the only good thing I could see about the shorts was if they were cooler, is that if they went on a call, and I'm talking medical call because that's where your bloodborne pathogens are going to be, they would have to wear their bunker pants so they didn't get anything on them because the patients are either bleeding, vomiting, urinating, defecating, you name it. So I'm going to have to protect that person to make sure they don't get any of this on them. And 
there is actually a rule in NFPA that says a firefighter is not to wear structural firefighting gear in a house unless it's on fire because it has carcinogens and bad stuff on it unless they wash their gear every time they went on a call. So they would not be able to wear their structural firefighting gear and they're going to have shorts on in a house that uh, on a medical call. I don't approve, so I'm asking the, for the recommendation from this committee. Chief Fairbanks, as a first responder myself, I couldn't imagine showing up at a crash scene with a pair of shorts on. I, I've seen too many and what all's there that could injure you yourself, that a pair of pants would stop a puncture fairly quick. Uh, Commissioner Thompson. First of all, we don't need to call in the city. They want to wear shorts that corner. Next, there's always a lot of ugly legs around. <laughs> That's all I got. Commissioner Winters. Can, can they wear shorts in the their actual home, away from home, when they're, in, when they're on duty? Can they wear shorts in the facility there and then change quick on the way out? Do they have a way to do that? No, sir. Okay. And, the, and I hate to say this, and I'm cutting in a little bit, but the time that it would take to change into bunker gear to – from shorts to bunker gear to so on just to get to the scene, that's time that's been taken up on someone else's life on an emergency like that. So I think it is yours. Yeah, I, Commissioner Cry, you know. I'd like to make a couple of remarks. In one of my <clears throat> previous lives was 20 years in the military, six enlisted with the infantry MOS, so I've, I've worn the work clothes and went to Vietnam in 90 to 100 degree heat, 100% uh, humidity, and uh, never was it even thought of to wear shorts. And uh, the military has a policy dress-wise to wear shorts in certain locations, but not work uniform. I, I personally consider it a safety hazard, time-consuming if you follow up on Commissioner Winters' point on changing, it's time consuming. I don't want somebody changing clothes when my life is at risk. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we not allow these shorts to be used not only in the fire department, but along emergency services. Here we have a first and a second. Uh, Commissioner Riper, you had a question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, First of all, I want to expand on what uh, Commissioner Cry said. Um, yeah, military is a good example. They they can't up and just change back and forth. Uh, that that's a, a very good point. Uh, but the uh, next thing is is uh, they they stole my thunder, which is great. Uh, thank you for doing so. But I, I was going to make the same motion that we go with uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Fairbanks. Uh, he he's department head. He knows best. And that's what he's in there for. And so I, I, I feel like we should uh, follow uh, protocol that he, he sets forth. Commissioner Slater, you had a question? I don't know if I so much have a question as a comment. And I apologize. I have to leave after this for another meeting. But I don't think it's typical that you come or previously that you have come to this body and ask for policies do you not make your own policies so why would this have to come before this committee why would you not just say this is the policy and this is how we're going to operate as the leader of that group but th that doesn't matter to me if you're in charge you make the decisions not, not this body as a as a committee over emergency service committee, I have no issues if a if a person over that department decides they want to bring something to a committee and ask for their advice or ask for them to vote on something. I I personally feel that's what we're here for is to help them as a department head. But uh, we have a first and a second on that. And this is not, if we chose to do this, is that money even in the budget to do so? I don't have money other than my uh, uniform allowance already for these blue uniforms that they're wearing. 
Right. Uh, I don't have any extra money for shorts. Right. So we have a motion on the floor, second to not approve shorts being worn. Is that the correct way of putting that? Right. All in favor? Aye. 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 The most. Is there any other questions before I move on? Motion passed unanimously. All right. Volunteer compensation. I believe this is another one you may have put on for us. Please. Thank uh, you, Commissioner Slater. Also, I'm going to um, turn this over to Mr. Maney because you'll probably want to know how the pay is for uh, volunteer retention. But as we've been doing the budget and stuff, we we have um, actually exceeded the the allowed funds to do volunteer retention to pay them uh we pay quarterly uh or every three months or something like that for people that uh participate in our volunteer program trying to bring, maintain and uh promote volunteers uh firefighters for bradley county um toward the end of the budget year sometimes we run short or run out of that money uh to give them a little check for uh paying back some gas type stuff, whatever. Uh, and even when doing our budget this last time and there was a an amendment that was almost done uh, to put money in there, and that's not what I wanted to do. If we run out, we run out. If they miss one check, it's one check. The, the max somebody usually gets, if they run everything, would be $300 for three months, you know. It, it's uh, kind of just helping put some fuel back in their tank I guess what we run into is is they come to a station or they come to uh, a meeting or a training of some sort and they count that as their time and uh, granted we're not paying big bucks here for this program but I don't get volunteers on a fire scene whatsoever I got two that I can count on to bring me a truck uh, in the north end of this county. Besides that, I hardly ever see them on a fire scene. I need volunteer firefighters on a fire scene. I need help. That's what we want them for. We equip them. Some are provided radios. The ones that aren't have bought their own radios, we pay for the uh, radio fees per year. We try to compensate as much as we can. But I want it to be, uh, I guess, reversed to where you get compensated for coming to fires and calls that you are available to come to. And um, the meetings, and I went by a fire hall and checked on this, and I went and sat at the station for this much time, pay me. I, I don't need that. I need firefighters to be on scene. So... I'm going to let Troy speak about how the pay goes, and then if it's okay, we'll have more discussion if you want. I couldn't have said it any better everything did in the way he summed everything up. Uh, we've always paid based on points. You can do it. You can earn it one of three ways. Any, any three things together out of our category of about nine, you can earn money for it. Uh, this has not been revised since 2016. That's why we're bringing it to you today. We do need to change it. Like he said, we need boots on the ground, not sitting at stations. Uh, he, he was correct when he said there's not a lot of money involved. Quarterly, it's, you know, 11 to maybe $1,800, $1,900 every quarter. So it's not a lot of money we're talking about. It's just getting the people there. If you look at the worksheet, there's plenty of time spent station time, manning station, but calls per hour, uh, and we pay it, it was based on $5 an hour, $2 an hour for every hour after that, and and in 2016, that was great, they were showing up, but now, like Chief said, they're not doing anything except station time, so that's, that's our issue. So if it's okay, if we want to have discussion, I would like to change. I, I don't even care what the dollar amount is, if you want to change the dollar amount or whatever, but station time and training time that they come meet 
they, they have a monthly meeting first Thursday of every month. Uh, Chief Stewart's been providing hot dogs and chips for them, so he's getting a big turnout on that one. <laughs> We're paying for that. Uh, so, and I understand that it's important to come to training, and I want them to, but I'm not getting boots on the ground. We are putting a lot of time and effort into equipment and materials to provide for them and the training, but I don't get boots on the ground. If they can't come, that's fine because of their work or their family. I understand, but I don't feel like we need to be paying out money just because they say, well, I'm on a station for a few hours and I want some money. I, I, I want boots on the ground when it's time to, to work. Commissioner Cross. Uh, well, I guess this is my day to talk. So, uh, you you said something, Chief Parabanks, that concerns me on the front end. You've already spent your allocation or budgetary amount of money for this year. Is that right? Last year's. Okay. So they didn't get they didn't get their check for the last quarter for last year's budget. I, I came up the hard way in life, and if you work, you get paid. Okay. Whatever we have to do, if we work someone, they should get paid. That's just my two cents worth. Uh, the other issue I have is not an issue. The comments really relating to these volunteer firemen. I can recall about three years ago, four years ago, we didn't have enough volunteer firemen to even keep a couple of these stations open. Now we're at least we're worrying now about them coming to training. Uh, I would think from a management point of view, somewhere someone could dictate over a quarterly, you said you pay them quarterly, uh, that they attend so many or so many drills or fires by a call that they be there. If not, they, they get pay cut something because a fire has no no issue with what time of the day or night it happens. And I would think that they should they should be put on notice that they get all this training. Let's put some of it to use. Uh, and the other thing about the pay, you've got five vacancies, and I don't know what the starting salary is for a fireman, but you divide 32000 or 36000 by 12, that's $3,000 a month. You've got five vacancies. That's $15,000 a month. I don't see an issue on money. Uh, move it from one budget line to the other, mayor's current. Uh, but I, uh, if they're going to go through all this training, they need to put it to good use and make sure they at least respond to a fire call a quarter or two fire calls, whatever. That's up to you. But uh, I can vividly recall we were having serious problems on volunteer firemen. We don't have that issue apparently anymore. We're worried more about paying them. Uh, that's just my rule. Commissioner Thompson. Uh, I think probably that was a good thing from the beginning, volunteer firemen. And uh, at that time, we had a lot of volunteers. They paid nothing. Uh, so after we got a full time fire department, but I think that's the time to pay them something for the cash. Before that, we even paid, I think, some to help pay for the cash and stuff like this. But the uh, only problem I have with uh, paying a volunteer good money, I don't have a problem with it, except the fact that you have some that uh, that's all they're there for. That's not, that's not a good reason to be there. To make a little extra money, and uh, they need to think about the fire department itself and what they need to do to help uh, to help earn that uh, money. You're right; they need they need. I'm with the try. They need to pay some money to go to a fire, but uh, if they don't. They don't have boots on the ground, and they. I don't see that uh, that should be the part that you penalize. You need to make that a you need to make that a an order that you do have a fire in their area. They knew they need to uh, end that fire if they're available. 
how to work. But you got to have some teeth in it. If you don't, if you don't, they're gonna they're gonna do what they want to do. Uh, I've, I've dealt with them a long time. But that's just something you got to do. You got to have some teeth in there. And, uh, tell them that that's what they got to do. And I know that's gonna make it harder to get volunteers. Still, that's the reason we got a full time fire department too. So uh, <coughs> that's uh, and try to work with the volunteers. Hopefully, we got enough full-time firemen that uh, we've got a full-time fire department that we don't have to fully depend on volunteers. So if we don't, then we need to look about hiring some more firemen. Commissioner Winters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what what increment increase if they attended the training sessions when they come? What would you think is fair? Seven dollars, eight dollars. Ten dollars. What do they currently get paid for a training session, or two dollars? Is it hourly or just? Okay, so they're getting paid two to go to a training session. To go to a training session, and if it goes over an hour, they're getting another two or whatever. Well, what if What if they go to a training session and they get paid five bucks if they come to work with you, or they get paid seven bucks if they come to work a little while? And tie your training to an increment when they come to actually do what uh, Commissioner Thompson is saying, uh, boots on the ground with that. If they come to boots on the ground and they've been to training session, they get X dollars. What what should that be? Seven bucks? You're saying uh, if they combine and do all their training and put well, boots on the ground? If they go to the training sessions you request they go to and then show up at, a, at uh, an actual fire, then uh, pay them – Five dollars an hour or two dollars an hour. Or I don't. I think. I think. Are two, we currently at five or for fires? Five per call. So they're already getting five per call. Five per call, two per hour. After that. And you want to increase that five, or you want to pay the? I would the, increase coming to a fire call or a you know just a call in general versus. Yep what they get paid to sit at a station or say they okay. went by that station. So if they did training sessions and come to that fire, what should they be increased to? Seven dollars? Ten dollars? Seven fifty? Seven to ten. Seven to ten. Yeah, I'm good with it. And you got the funds at this point to set it to that. Mr. Maney just made a good point. We're paying a part time person that has all their certifications that wants to work like a Saturday or something to fill in. We're paying them ten dollars an hour. Okay, so you want to pay them a little, this trainee a little less, I guess, than that. No, I'm good with it. If I don't know. A volunteer is important. Yeah. Uh, there's been times that those that those two volunteers I've talked about from the north, yeah. if they wouldn't have bought, brought us a tanker truck or a, another piece of equipment, it would be a lot harder. Okay. I want the volunteers. I okay. want them to be there. I, I'm just, I don't think it's fair to the county to pay out for them to come to social club meetings, yeah. training sessions, yeah. whatever you want to call them, yeah. and not showing up for fires or fire calls that they are eligible to go to. So uh, We're putting a lot of training, let's say, and we're putting a lot of equipment into it, but we're not getting anything out of it. To, okay. They're not fulfilling their end of the contract. So, we'll, so you recommend a figure, $7.50. $7.50 sounds if, good. If that's been, what you want to recommend. If they've, been if they've gone to training sessions. If they have to have so many training sessions to be allowed on the fire ground. Okay. Is there any type of requirement that within a month they have to go to so many fire scenes to be a to be on the volunteer? Why not just put something like that in place and that will eliminate a lot of that? Or you may lose all your volunteers, one of the two. No, I don't want to lose any volunteers. I'm just, I don't want us to pay out county tax dollar money because somebody said they went down to the Maroon Branch Station and sat for two or three hours. Hmm. I don't have no way. I'm not saying anybody's lying, but yeah. okay. that yeah. didn't. I, I volunteered. I volunteered for five years before I got started in everything. Yeah. I didn't get paid a dime, but I enjoyed what I did, and I wanted to help my community. Commissioner Crow. I, I'm just in amazement. We were serving hot dogs and whatever at training <laughs> session. I never heard of such a thing, but... Uh, I think that's a management issue on these training sessions. That's your job to get this under control. They need to train it, all right? They, God help us if we're not training them. And they need paid for it. 
uh, private industry, they pay their employees when they send them to training, uh, almost without exception. And we have that responsibility for our, for our employees. Uh, I look back, it's, it's a responsibility of the management to make sure they do their thing. And uh, if we're going to serve them a damn buffet out there, hell, we need to get something out of it. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Mr. Thompson. Uh, what kind of budget? You'd have to have a different budget if you if you paid them like we're talking about here, right? I don't believe so. I got a line to pay it out of. I'm good with that. What I'm asking is let's lower or keep the same for training. Just because you went by a station or just because you're an officer doesn't mean you're entitled to money. Because some of them have titles as lieutenants and commanders or whatever. They get paid extra a month for doing that position with no responsibility in my book. So I'm willing to pay for training and I'm willing to pay more for fire calls. Let's say that's 750 make it more enticing to come to a call than to go to a training, but I'm still going to pay for training because you're taking your time to come and burning your gas, and we got to have the training. So, but all the other little frivolous stuff, I guess I'm wanting to do away with and just wanting approval that you all think that's the right thing to do. What, uh, what, quali not qualifications, I don't guess, but what, uh, I think that would be probably up to you to make up something in a letter form or whatever. They have to qualify. See. Yeah. Deputy Chief Stewart can correct me if I'm wrong, but they have to have a 16-hour course, and then we usually do a 64-hour uh, course uh, to kind of get them going on that. If you, am I missing anything there? Okay. So that's required to be going to calls. So we're just wanting to uh, cut out some of the frivolous stuff that the volunteers are receiving compensation for that I feel like, and that's personal, I guess, if I say frivolous, because I spent a lot of time at the Charleston Fire Hall when I was a volunteer, but if I could have wrote down time and money for it, I might not be here today. I might be a millionaire. Who knows? So... Chief Fairbanks, I believe that the if you had something drawn up that this commission or this committee could see after you get done with that policy, if you can bring that back, I don't think you'd have a problem with having it voted on. I'll bring it back to the next meeting. But just, uh, if you will, I think that this committee is happy with raising the amount as long as it's in your budget and not yep. going to cause any problems. If you want to add whatever you're going to add, just let us know. Uh, I'll and put that in proposal form and bring it back to this committee. I think you'll be fine. Mr. Alford. Just a question, clarification for me, Sean. Why do they go to the fire station and just sit around? Is there a requirement for y'all to do that? No. But they take it, they can go by and check on a truck, check the oil, make sure everything's good working order. I don't know. I think in the old days, wasn't it, that they, we had so many volunteers, I think they only got paid when they went on a call. Is that correct? I don't know. Troy's older than me. What did what they do? <laughs> I, can, I can remember back years ago when you, you know, when you're a fire, you'd see volunteers coming from every direction, you know, because I, I think they got paid per call. Well, and that's correct. They did back then. And, and we're still kind of doing that now. Like the chief said, we're just not paying. We want to pay more per call. And some of the ways they can earn different money is some of their station duties may be to come and wash the trucks, stand by during a storm, stand by if we've got a major fire working somewhere else. A lot of times they'll man those trucks. And the way the policy's wrote now, they get to they get to count that. So with what he's wanting to do is let's pay them to be on the ground working and not standing by a station. A lot of times they'll stand by and we don't know they're standing by until 
calls over, and then they'll say, oh, yeah, I was standing by up in Charleston. We didn't know that at the time. That clarifies it to me to some degree, but I agree with Chief here that we do need to stop the frivolous stuff and up the up the call money. We'll, we'll fix that policy and bring it back for review. I think that would be perfect. Thank okay. you. Commissioner Cry, you had a question? Oh, I, I just want to go back and touch on an earlier point. Uh, I, I have absolutely no patience for if you run out of money and overspend your budget. No excuse for it. Uh, I just want to make that point because you, you touched on it on last year's budget. You overspent on the firemen. Well, you had all this other funds you could have moved from line to line. I, I don't. I just don't have patience for spending more than we're allocated. I'll be honest. I just wanted to make that point. Commissioner Thompson. I don't have a lot of patience when I run out of money myself. <laughs> But right. anyway, on these on these full time stations you have, or, well, you have two firemen and you know, like Taylor and Prospect and where else? There are two man stations at Taylor, Prospect, and McDonald. Okay, what does your volunteers do there? Do they participate a lot in with those people? They can. They can. Yeah, there's no restriction on what station. For a volunteer, we there is no restriction for what station they go to. Commissioner Raper, thank you, um, Mr. Firebanks. Um, uh, in your report, can you include also um, the fact of uh, you mentioned at times that they may come in and make extra money washing a truck? Can you uh, list uh, like amount of times so that way you say? Um, Washing a truck may take two hours, but uh, I took five, you know. Uh, so uh, can you sort of, uh, uh, on those extra duties, can you list the amount of hours so that uh, we can have a good idea uh, what we're talking about? Yes, sir. Thank you. I think the, are you not planning on taking that out, though? Yes. Okay. So it'll be easy. Uh, is there any other questions about the volunteer compensation? So seeing none, let's move on to other business. Anybody have any other business? Hey, Commissioner Cry. Uh, I'd like to talk about a thorn in my side if I use it correctly. Uh, I, I've been to the hospital in the general area of the emergency room. I noticed a number of our county ambulance parked there. Uh, not at the station as they should be or on call, but they have parked there. And uh, I'd like to just remind everyone, and there's a federal law on this. Once a patient arrives on the hospital's property, the patient is legal, is the legal responsibility of the hospital. Hospital staff can ask EMS personnel to remain with the patient if the hospital staff is too busy. Hospitals have, have a duty of care to the patient under federal law once, the, once uh, on hospital property. EMS personnel have no such duty under federal law. Once a patient arrives on the hospital property, the patient is the legal responsibility of the hospital. And I'd just like to emphasize that. Now, we, uh, we've gone through a bit of... Uh, a business of talking to them at the hospital on uh, anything over 30 minutes we we uh, charge them I thought we were going to bill them but we haven't yet and uh, I think each one up here has a copy of this uh, I have a couple of questions on this uh, how much per hour did you come up with to arrive at what we're billing in our discussion we had with the hospital, uh, Mr. Hughes was in attendance, Mr. Lewis was in attendance, I was, Mr. Ryberg. Uh, discussions with them were that the ambulance wait times every, after 30 minutes and no movement of patient from ambulance stretcher to hospital stretcher, 
after 30 minutes, a $300 charge would incur. Then every hour after that, another $300. Um, the reason we come up with that is if an ambulance is on standby for a special event, that is an estimated uh, dollar amount of what an ambulance is missing out on per hour generating. Which, to help you, Commissioner Cry, I'll go back in time for you. That, that meeting was actually on July 14th. If you'll notice on the printout, I've actually formally requested to get that because we have started keeping up with times and amounts and so on. I, if you'll notice, that started on July 18th. Uh, we've all of us have that, uh, and you'll see that bottom line by the end of it is. I mean, we're less than three weeks, or it's what three weeks away since that meeting, and they assured us at that time that within 20 minutes, was it they would have them off our stretcher. Uh, here we are at thirty thousand dollars worth of bills if we were billing, uh, and it's it doesn't look like it's getting any better. I see one time here, two and a half hours. I see two of those actually, two and two hours is thirty five minutes, two hours twenty five minutes. It is a disservice to our community, our citizens in Bradley County, that are the taxpayers that are voting for this or paying for this. Uh, the hospitals, and this is not for Tenovo alone. This is all hospitals are privately owned. I'm not in the business of using taxpayers' money to fund a privately owned business. I think it's it's a disservice to our citizens over that. The other fact is, is what got me interested in this was that um, we'd had an issue where a person at, the, at our local sheriff's department had had a heart attack. They call it the widow maker. We had an ambulance that they, we called in for an ambulance. The ambulance said it was going to be 30 minutes before they got there. The more I looked into it, as, as we found out earlier, we are severely understaffed. We had several units at the time up at the hospital. Those units should have been out and picking up our patients, not taking care of patients that belong to the hospital. So that's what got me on this ball. Now, under that, I've asked uh, Miss Stacy to come in today because she can explain a lot of this herself. I, I have requested a lot of information from her. And by now, so we've got to know each other fairly well because of it. Um, and thank you for working with me on this stuff because it is difficult to understand without having somebody there also helping you through some of this stuff. But uh, first, let's move on to the billing. Yes, we did have that discussion. The intent was given that we could start billing. I said, however, we're going to bring it before this committee and then move it from there. So... With that, I'm going to allow the committee to move with the billing however they wish. Can I speak? Yes. Thank you. Uh, this thing here is two pages long. Like uh, Mr. Hughes stated, it goes from July the 18th through July the 31st, and there were 77 billings. All right. Uh, for a total of roughly $30,000, what makes this significant to me. I've been around here about eight years now, and uh, I recall about every year, we're about a million dollars off of the checks that the ambulance serves. Now that, to me, is indefensible. Uh, it has to be corrected. Uh, God knows how the mayor compensates or adjusts for a million dollar discrepancy on projected income every year, but he does. Uh, we're going to have to start Billing, they have uh, acknowledged it apparently in a meeting. Uh, the county attorney was there, and the mayor's assistant was there, and so was the commissioner Hughes. So it's time to get moving on this. I, I just make those comments. Commissioner Thompson. Uh, have we billed that? Uh, you run it through the billing company, the same one that bills Hamlet Service. If we bill it, it will go through the billing company. Yes. They haven't. Uh, they haven't billed anything yet. No, sir. So, what? What's the total? Approval. Approval. From I guess if that's what you are wanting to do. Just need to be paid for the service. 
Mr. That's Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to seal it. Do we have a second? We have a motion and a second. Commissioner Winters. The CEO was there also, plus the co-CEO and so on. So there's several people. I didn't hear them say no. So their commitment was is that they'd be a, they'd put a time clock inside that they could clock in people. Although we're keeping up with our time, that would be for them. They would clock it in for the show stretcher time and then go from there. Yes, it, it actually gets bigger than this, and I'm going to ask Miss Stacy to come up because it to explain this. There is also an issue where this has been going on for years, where insurance, after hours, a patient has been called, or where they're calling for us to pick up a patient at the hospital. They're not verifying this with, through through the ambulance or through the uh, insurance agency, which in the end it, we're being stuck with money. Uh, it, quite honestly. We pulled a sample selection of that, and I think it was 51 calls from the billing company already, uh, $56,182, and that was prior to the meeting, about a year long, that that we had no funds come in for. Oh, we're just not verifying it through the insurance company. Since this meeting from July 21st to July 31st, uh, we have already had one, two, eight more, there's no dollar amount on this to show the amount of it, but eight more that has come in that we are honestly not being paid for but through the patient or through the hospital at this point. So, Miss Stacy, if you, do you mind coming up here and sit next to Adam there? And then, Adam, I'm sorry, do you, did you have some? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, frankly, um, I think I think you need to be careful with where the direction of this meeting is headed in terms of a decision without consulting with our county attorney. Um, she and I were both in the meeting as well, and each of us came away from that meeting with a much different perspective of how that meeting went than what's being, being discussed. Uh, it was briefly mentioned to the hospital staff that this was a possibility and that it was being discussed but there was no negotiation, there was no agreement. In fact, after the meeting, uh, and as, as late as last week, they are, are under the understanding that this is an issue that, that they wish to work with us on. One of the things that they asked for and have asked for repeatedly is, is data regarding how long the wait times are. And mm -hmm. to this point, they still have not received the data to be able to uh, determine and work on the issue themselves. So. Um, I understand it's a concern, Chief but Fairbanks. I think we also I'm sorry, need. Adam. I'm huh? sorry. Chief Fairbanks, can you send them this data and the other, please? Thank you. They will receive their data. Yeah, I think it, I think we also need to be mindful of the fact that uh, they are our partner, and they are in much the same boat that we are as far as being short-staffed. And I understand that the the legality of when the patient drives into that parking lot matters um, but there are also times when we can't take transports because they call and we have to make them wait so are, are we going to now expect to be billed by them um, Mr. I, Lewis that is actually their patient at that hospital I understand as that. far as our concern our concern is to the citizens of Bradley County quite honestly if that officer had died after being left there for 30 minutes with a widow maker heart attack who do you think would be liable for that death do you think it would be Tanova, which is privately owned, or would it be this county that is owned by all citizens and taxpayers? I, I understand that. I just think that you need to be careful about making a decision in this committee you, I think our without discussing this with Crystal. I think our responsibilities are to the citizens of Bradley County. Be sure you're being legal is all I ask. By my understanding is from the county attorney, they can be charged. Everything I've said and researched myself, they can be charged. Mr. Chief Fairbanks, I thought or I felt like after we moved from, or left that meeting, the intent, because I know I said it numerous times, of the intent of what we were planning on doing was, was thoroughly understood. If I'm in mistake with that, please correct me. 
Right. So the motion's been made in the second. Do you, does anybody want to remove the? No, but I want to. Yes. Okay. First of all, they're short staffed. I'm sure of that. And that's that's not our problem. That's their problem. By their staff. It's not a Bradley County hospital in it. No. They didn't want Erlanger and they didn't want Memorial in here. They don't want no competition whatsoever. So if they don't want any competition, they need to do the job or grow enough to do the job. The county grows, they need to But uh, you're right, if we stay over there so long, that needs to be put in writing or whatever. And we need to bill them. Their place to pay that, pay that, and uh, I'm sure it would be our place if we were in their place. So uh, I think we need to bill them, and then we'll go from there and see what happens. Mr. Wayne, uh, not having been in that meeting in Stufford, uh, and I, I think both points are very, very cogent here, and very much should be said. If we have an attorney involved, maybe we should hold our vote until the attorney advises us, since she's ours. And then if we have the vote that uh, we were ready to go forward with this uh, with the legal action. Uh, I get the point about being partners, and I get the point that we're saying here about this is taxpayer dollar, and we're, we're both right. So the question here is, are, are we legal in this? And if we're legal in this, we go forward. If we're not, then we have that next meeting and we do exactly what we've said here, that uh, there is a, a remuneration that has to be made by the, by the hospital, uh, and uh, we expect that to be done uh, and uh, move forward. But uh, I, not being in that meeting, it's awfully tough for us to determine, and if, the, if, it is, if there is a legal question of where we go with this, with both uh, partnerships involved here, uh, maybe we should uh, hold this vote until we get further information. That's all I have. So. Yep. Mr. Tom. Can we not go ahead and vote on this at the county attorney handling the matter? We can. See what her recommendation is. Mr. Mr. Wayne. I, I think once we commit to this, we're committing to them paying through a collections agency 30000 And I think that's that may be where the majority is at this point. But maybe we should ask the uh, legal reference to that, and then even in that, let the partners that we're talking about here know that we're we're to this point, and uh, then we meet next week or whenever after we get legal information and we know what our partners are saying they're going to pay. Because you have the other side of this question of uh, uh, their their concern about some of the things we did. I don't know. I wasn't there, but in that whole scene. I'd rather have a little more conversation than a litigation. Minister Winters to help you out. I had actually originally requested them to come to this committee meeting. I I was told quickly that they would not come to a public meeting. So therefore, even if we sent word and they sent word back, how do we know what they're really saying is coming from somebody else? So there's there's no way of ever knowing what they're going to say. The the truth of it is the it's not about the money. It's not about wanting them to pay funds. Truthfully, it's more of them wanting them to just do their part and do their job. They are leaving our citizens. I, and it goes back to the disservice to our citizens. We have people that are landing in homes now that is our responsibility that we can't get to because we have ambulances on their property with their patients. So that that is where my issue comes into. If we could, if they just do what they said about the twenty minutes, we wouldn't be discussing this now. But it goes back to what I was saying. The other is is where they're not verifying the insurance. There is one charge in here for one patient that went to Turkey Creek up in Knoxville. I have this paper right here. That is seventeen hundred dollars that we personally eat. They have the same documentation. I showed it to them. Here you go. I'll pass this. Here you all do. 
and it's going to be easier for Miss Stacy to explain how that works. So, Miss Stacy, if you'll come up, please. Turkey Creek, not a Canova Hospital. It is. Mm. Thought it was. So instead of sending them to Erlinger or Memorial, they just transport them on up to Knox. Keep so. your damn. <laughs> Keep your damn. Okay. So trips, transports that are not authorized, that's usually going to be patients that have a 10 care plan. Um, patients that have a 10 care plan, uh, non emergency transportation by ambulance requires prior authorization. The call centers are open 24 7. Um, the reason we have taken transports that were not authorized, there's several factors involved. Um, sometimes the emergency room says, well, this is an emergency, therefore it doesn't require authorization. Um, just because that doctor or even a nurse says, oh, this is an emergency, does not mean that it qualifies to be billed as an emergency legally, um, you know, through our billing practices. Um, we still have to meet criteria with our reporting and how it was dispatched and everything else and the patient's actual medical condition, um, you know, as reported through the hospital records and our report. If it was not an emergency, we can't bill it as an emergency just to avoid the fact that it, it didn't have, wasn't properly authorized. Um, I've been at EMS for more than 20 years. All of those trips that we've always done that were not authorized, they've been written off. We can't bill a 10 care patient for something that, that wasn't authorized. We legally cannot bill them. We have to write that off. Um, through our current billing company and the one prior, they m many times, sometimes every other day, bring to my attention Technically, we could bill the hospital. The sending facility is technically responsible for paying for that if they did not get it properly authorized. We've never done that because we've never broached that subject with the hospital. Um, we've just always eaten it. We've just always written it off. Um, the wait times are a totally separate issue um, to be dealt with, however they're dealt with. But as far as the billing them for the trips that are not authorized, I can assure you that there's plenty of other Tanova facilities that that is their standard practice to pay for those types of transports that they did not get properly authorized. Um, that's how it's done. We've just never done it that way. Um, I, I think it would be beneficial to do it that way. It, we're missing a lot of money by not asking them to pay for something that they failed to do. Um, our job is to make sure it's done, you know, the transports occur, um, the patients are taken care of. When these requests for transportation come in during the day that we're in the office, part of what we do in the office is make sure that there's the not an authorization. We make sure everything's in order so that we can get paid. But when the transport requests come in from the emergency room, it's usually the emergency room. Um, when they come in after hours or on the weekends, there's nobody in the office. Um, uh, there, there's several factors involved at the hospital. Also, even if, if, um, even if we did have someone um, at dispatch, for example, that was asking all the right questions about is this authorized or whatever, a lot of times the face sheet that the hospital um, staff is looking at, the demographic sheet, it's not usually updated at the point that they're calling, you know, dispatch to ask for an ambulance. So they don't know sometimes that that patient has a 10 care plan because registration hasn't put them in the system yet. I mean, there's a lot of factors involved, but plenty of other facilities um, are billed by ambulance services um, for failure to get authorizations. I'm going to ask you a question. On most of these calls, I know we spoke about it, most of these calls, of what I can understand, was actual after hours, after yes. you were gone and there was no one there. Yes. Because apparently you catch a bunch of these through the daytime and you correct yes. them. These are really coming in more of after you're already left and then they're just, well, just to go ahead and explain it. 
so they understand how it's happening. Yeah, when if if their demographics are not updated into Nova System, first of all, the person who's looking up their demographics to, you know, get get everything set up for a transfer to another facility, they're not going to know that that patient has ten care. Um, other than that, if, if it's after hours, the hospital calls our nine one one center. Most of the dispatchers do ask, what insurance does this patient have? Um, because that's important. Um, most, you know, there's times that the dispatchers catch it on that end. And they're like, oh, well, that needs an authorization. But, you know, we've given them a list of what requires authorization, and they do catch some. But they're 911 dispatchers. Insurance isn't their job. That's, you know... They're just taking the calls for the request for the, the ambulance. Um, there's really no other way to catch those unless, you know, our crews, they ask for a face sheet, the demographic sheet. If they see it on there, they can say, hey, did you get this authorized? But again, usually that, that demographic sheet hasn't been updated uh, to what's current for this patient's visit on that day. And that was another thing I brought up with that during that meeting was them being responsible for that. I don't know which meeting you want to hear about, but roughly the one I was in, it was brought up, and I did not hear them say that they were in disagreement with that. Uh, in fact, everything I could hear was, we're going to fix this, we're going to do this, we're going to do better. But as you see, since that meeting on the 14th, there's already been eight of these already. It's not being corrected too quickly. And I know that accidents will happen, but it was brought up in the meeting that they would receive a bill for that. Um, yes. Mr. So. Chairman, the overall take that Crystal and I had from the meeting was that it was a very cooperative <laughs> attitude. They asked for more communication. This meeting was less than a month ago, and I don't believe they've had any communication since that meeting. All of the issues that have been raised on both sides, be it the ambulances at the door or what she's talking about, were discussed. They've had changes in leadership. They've looked at ways to, uh, they, they introduced us to the, to the new leadership and asked for more communication to work with them to resolve these issues. My only point is, if it's not about the money, sending them a $30,000 bill is not going to help them fill their staffing needs either. And so we've still got trucks waiting at the door. So my only request for whatever it's worth, which isn't much to anybody, I'm sure, is that you wait and let's do our due diligence. But more importantly, they were very cooperative and willing to work with us. When you told them, hey, we're thinking about charging you $300 after 30 minutes, he said, well, we just will work to make sure that doesn't happen. So this is not a problem that developed overnight. I don't think it's going to be a problem that gets solved overnight. But more importantly, I don't think it's going to be a problem that's solved without both sides actively communicating and working together to find the solution. Commissioner Carr. I uh, guess let me go back here a little bit. The attendees at this verbal meeting was the county attorney, assistant to the mayor, Commissioner Hughes, Fairbank, the chief operation officer and the president of the hospital. As I understood all except from Mr. Lewis, everyone was in agreement that we would do this. There was no discussion about uh, all this other nonsense here. Well, I'll tell you what it sounds like to me, exactly like the Republic on the landfill. They'll spin you to high heaven and not follow through on what they say. And uh, I think it's personally uh, put them on notice. If they don't pay, hell, it's their job to hire the people, pay them decently, and they can probably get them. Uh, and if they don't pay, send it over to collection. And if they don't collect there, put it, get a judgment and pull it out of their bank account. Mr. Rankin. Uh, this question's for uh, any of those that attended the meeting, but um, uh, I, I'm trying to understand how that uh, we have a, a, a patient that is deemed. Uh, an emergency by a physician or nurse, <clears throat> but later uh, the insurance deems it not. I mean, wh where's the breakdown here? I, I don't, I don't, 
I, I can explain. Um, it, it's not as fine of a line as you would think. I mean, some things are obviously an emergency, and there's never a question of that. A stroke, um, a STEMI, a, like a heart attack. Certain things are definitely emergencies. Um, I, I can give you an example. There was um, a juvenile that had um, swallowed a, a button battery. Very serious. It needs to be uh, handled immediately for several different reasons. Um, the ER physician called it an emergency. The patient had a 10 care plan and they knew that they wouldn't have to fool with authorization or anything like that and it would get them there quicker. Um, so they called it an emergency. Well, ambulance crew arrives. I'm obviously not on a crew, but you know, I read the report. You know, the child was alert and happy and walking around, you know, the, the emergency, the room there and you know, the child had no complaints, wasn't crying, uh, no pain anywhere. Um, we took that transport immediately. There was no delay in that. Um, <clears throat> but for uh, their safety issues, for several different reasons, they didn't run, in, you know, lights and sirens to get down to Chattanooga. There's safety issues there. Um, and there's, it's not that the insurance companies decide if it is or isn't an, emergen an emergency. It's more, it's, it's really Medicare CMS that defines what an emergency is. Um, it, it's not really the actual insurance companies. And so for billing, you have to follow the CMS guidelines. Uh, does this meet the criteria to be billed as an emergency or does it not meet the criteria to be billed as an emergency? Miss Stacy, on that patient you were discussing, if I'm not mistaken, was that the one that was also in ER waiting, the waiting room for several hours prior yes. to? Yes. Yes. It didn't become an emergency until? Yes. Mr. Hughes, <clears throat> may I make one more follow-up to that one? Is um, It seems to me if uh, in that situation it just gave, if you, if you have a doctor or a nurse that deems something an emergency, then it doesn't matter what anybody else, uh, it, it's an emergency. You know, so, uh, I mean, they're the qualified personnel. They've uh, done all the trainings. They've been to the schoolings. Uh, I don't see how uh, anybody uh, from insurance companies to anybody else can overrule that. Uh, e even the EMS person says, well, it's not an emergency. Well, it, if a doctor or a nurse says it is, well, it is. You know, I, I, don't, I don't see uh, how uh, somebody can overrule something like that. Yeah, so. It, it's, it's. There's a lot of different reasons. One of the reasons is to prevent abuse. Um, just like for a, I give you an, just for a non-emergency, uh, when we take someone non-emergency from the um, from the hospital back to their private home, um, the doctor has to sign what's called a, a physician certification statement that states the reasons the patient needs an ambulance to get home. Um, a, I can't, uh, probably at least half of them say patient is bed bound, all this other stuff. We get there, the patient is sitting up in their hospital bed. They stand up and walk to the restroom before they leave. Just because a doctor says or doesn't, doesn't mean that they're always um, honest with it. Um, it's also the abuse part. There's a lot of ambulance services in our country that are owned by hospitals. You get paid more for an emergency than you do a non-emergency. If they run all their calls, you know, that were transfers as an emergency, they're going to get paid more. A doctor, those doctors could call everything an emergency that's going to another facility. Um, so there's just a lot of different things that determine what we can legally. Like I said, it, it's federal rules um, made up by CMS. Mr. Tom. Listen, after all this discussion, what I understand, the hospital is using their ambulance room, and they're using their paramedic to take care of it. So the bottom line is that they're wrong. And that's all, that's all they're doing. They're using, they're, using their, they're using their ambulance to keep them there, and the paramedic people taking care of them. So they're just using them for room. So, uh, 
I think uh, we had a motion there. We got a motion on the floor to bill them, and I think we need to bill them. I don't care what they say. Uh, they, they'll tell you everything in the world. They've been around them a long time. They'll tell you anything in the world, but the best thing to do to get your attention is to bill them. Uh, Commissioner Riper, um, to answer your question on that, what the protocol is, is they should verify that through the insurance prior to them contacting us. It's not that we're saying it's not an emergency, it's just they're not doing their job on verification. Where if they verified it prior to, they would automatically know that the insurance government, the company, or to can't care whoever is not going to bill for that. So they could easily save, well, in this case, save us money because the, the actual ambulance service is not charging the patient for that. The patient is not the one that's calling, it's the hospital. The, um, so therefore we end up eating that bill or eating that mm -hmm. money. But mm -hmm. that's, that's really what it is. They're just not doing what, there's, what protocol is set forward. Yes, sir. May I, may I make one more comment? Yes, please. Um, who made the motion, uh, by the way? Uh, that was Mr. Hey. Commissioner Thompson made okay. a motion. It was seconded by Commissioner Cry. Would uh, um, it, would you all uh, consider um, adding to that if uh, Ms. Freiberg has some uh, issues with that, then um, the the motion uh, null and void or something? I, I'm uh, I, I am a little concerned about the possibility of Ms. Freiberg, uh, but. You know, uh, uh, just have a contingency in there if she had con uh, concerns about it. So, uh, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'd absolutely have to see the TCA that says that we can't bill them because everything I've seen so far, I plumbed down to, I'm trying to remember what the training group is. I had the attorneys for EMS. EMS 1 had attorneys that dealt with this issue, and even they were saying that, it can be charged, and quite honestly, we're not the first ones to bring this up. It, we're not the only one that's having this issue. Uh, Commissioner Winters. we're wanting is to get it done. I don't know whether we want to just throw at a $30,000 bill, whether we say we want you to put that in this bill, the rest of it, see what we get. Then we, having not been in that meeting and hearing that if there's two sides plus a lawyer in the middle of it, maybe to have a motion and we substitute or whatever. Real quick, Commissioner Winters, I'm not too concerned about the 30000 I think that would be a good point to be made to them that this, if we had billed them through this time, this is what you'd owe. You'd made the statement that you would correct these issues, including making the statement that you would buy a time clock that would clock in these patients. There's really no need to have this issue right now. There really isn't. But uh, Commissioner Alford and then Commissioner Cry. I wasn't at the meeting either, of course. I was the one that originally brought the whole scenario up about the ambulances sitting at the emergency room. But anyway, at that meeting, uh, I know listening to you, Commissioner Hughes, and, and listening to Mr. Adams, I don't think we have anything on paper that they said they'd do this or do that or vice versa. I would, because uh, they change people a lot up there, so we go over this deal, and we do this route, for example, on word of mouth, nothing written down. And next month, they bring in new CEO, and she says, hey, I ain't got nothing to do with this. I didn't have nothing to do with that. Well, there's nothing on paper. 
So I think we need to go ahead and vote on what you want to do, but I think sometime or another we need to get Crystal and them together and you or whoever we need to get together and come up with some written policies that this is going to happen, this is what we're going to do. And rather than, and, and I don't disagree with not sending them a bill, but I just don't think that uh, it will hold up if they bring in a new person, for example, and they say, I wasn't in the meeting. I don't know y'all nothing. Because there wasn't anything written down. It was there a, mem a minute taken? No, sir, there was not. There was no minutes either. So I think before we just throw it out there and charge them a bunch of money, which I don't have a problem with, I think we need to really sit down and look at getting something on paper that we both can live with. I, I will say this, too. Honestly, they do need to have a written notification of what our intent is that we're going to start charging them. And whether they agree with it, I don't know that they would ever sit there and say, yeah, we'll pay this. I, I just don't, in writing, that is. However, basically what we're doing today is setting policy that would be able for the fire or for EMS to follow on just billing. A, it's a new company being built, basically, new companies, because it would include all hospitals. I don't want to make it sound like we're picking on Tenova. I'm not, by no means. This is not an issue of just Tenova. This is an issue with all hospitals, and it's not just our ambulance service that has the issue. Hey, Commissioner Cry. I, uh, I'd just like to add, this is basically standard policy uh, for many municipalities or counties that have ambulance services or deal with hospitals. They are aware of this. As I understand it, there were certain individuals on their side that made the verbal statement mm -hmm. that, that this is ongoing. We, we don't do it here, uh, but at other places that they own, they pay. Uh, I have, I'm, I am like uh, Commissioner Hughes. I'm not hung up on the $30,000, but hell, we've been dealing with a million dollars every year, so 30000 is not that critical at this point. Uh, but I'm for passing this, maybe making a substitute motion that we start on the 15th of August and send them a letter uh, to that effect and send them a copy of what it would have been in, mm. in roughly two and a half weeks in July that they would have voted. The, uh, from talking to people that have been to Tanova, the facilities are great. The problem is personnel. They've got one floor closed down. They've got another floor with one RN, the person I talked to, and they've got one RN at most of the time in the emergency room. Outside of that, I don't know. Their bureaucracy might be the problem in not hiring people. But uh, I'm all for voting on it. I might want to, if Thompson agree, we send yeah, a well, letter. Thank you. I, I know this. But the city did that. I, I wouldn't mind doing a substitute motion. Just often said that at this motion, hey, that you know, future meetings, we'll have parameters of that meeting that we actually put in the air committee. Forward. All right. Right. Real quick. Had a second or a substitute motion made by Commissioner Cry. Does anyone want to second that? Sorry. Well, I, I didn't know it was a yeah, I'm about to go back because well, I believe we all have to vote on that first and then vote to make the. Yes. Are you seconding? You want to re, re state I think it? Uh, Commissioner Thompson made the original motion. Yes, it has to be bill. approved by you. And I seconded uh, that motion after listening to Commissioner Alford. And I, Commissioner Hughes, I made a substitute motion that we delay the collection until 15 August implementing that interim. We send them a letter along with a copy of what it would have been in July. And uh, that was my substitute. You got a second with that? So everybody's approved agreement with the yeah. substitute. Commissioner. Only thing I'll say, I'm going to vote for it. If I've got a hospital bill up there, if I don't pay it, they sue me. First thing they do, they send you a letter and sue you. Now you tell me that's not true. 
ain't much difference here. I agree with you. We'll take a little more time, but uh, I think we've had enough of time. Thirty thousand dollars may not mean much to y'all, but it does to me. Taxpayer. I do believe also to correct something. As far as we were talking about the emergencies earlier, what the actual billing would be would be for it's for the not doing the pre approval pre authorization on those, not necessarily the emergency itself. So that's just not being done. That's what we were actually discussing. But anyway, a motion's been made, seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 So motion passes unanimously. I'd like to oh, go ahead. Now that Mr. we voted, I, I would like to ask our new state representative, congratulations. Put this on your itinerary on doing <laughs> something about this when you get up there. <laughs> First deal. <laughs> we'll give you something to start off with. with too. <laughs> Bring back uh, a report. Congratulations. Tear them papers with you. All right. <laughs> All right, I do believe in it. Unless there's other business, uh, the meeting's right. adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, That's all right. We got something. Thank you, Hunter.